You guys remember the Kandahar giant from Mr. Ballin's story? Yes, that Afghanistan giant was real. You are now in for a treat. Here is the Blurry Creatures podcast's interview with Timothy Alberino, who previously interviewed the pilot that transported the body of that dead giant out of Middle East. But today we really wanted to get into the topic of giants, which is something that's been a recurring theme on our show. We want to talk specifically about some things that you mentioned in the last our last interview, which was there's this story of this giant that was killed in the caves of Afghanistan by U.S. military. And you interviewed the pilot who supposedly flew this beast out of the mountains of Afghanistan. We thought you'd bring, bring you back on today, talk about that, and talk about the ancient giants and keep the conversation going. So can you tell us a little bit more about this story of this pilot that flew this giant out of the mountains of Afghanistan? Yes, Steve Quayle and I, um, when we were doing the True Legends episode two, The Unholy Sea, we interviewed the pilot. And you can see in the, in the I, th- I believe the, the documentary opens with this interview. And uh, we, we, we shot him in silhouette, um, but he showed us his credentials. He was a really, really interesting guy. How do you how do you track that guy down? Yeah, I think he. I believe, if I remember the story correctly, he got in contact with Steve. I think he heard Steve on the Hagman program. I can't remember exactly how he got in contact with Steve, uh, but we we interviewed him for the documentary, and um, we got to spend some time with him. A uh, really nice guy, really credible guy in my estimation. <clears throat> Again, he showed us his credentials, and he was active duty. He was active duty AC one. 30 pilot. And the story goes, let me see if I can re- recall this accurately. During the uh, Iraq war, uh, he was deployed. He would, he would always fly in and, and to different bases and pick up cargo. That was his job and, and move, move cargo around. Sometimes he would, he would fly in and pick up different kinds of military assets, you know, people, special forces teams, or he would pick up. Uh, I remember he told me that he would fly in to pick up the bad guys. You know, they'd be all uh, uh, they'd be handcuffed and, and with bags over their heads and he'd fly in and, and pick those guys up sometimes. And so, so he was, he was, he would, he would fly in and out. Uh, I'm trying to think of the terminology he used, the, the uh, military terminology he used. Um, high value uh, assets, kind of top secret type stuff. And when he would fly into a mission like that, uh, they would tell him before he got off the plane, they would tell him, look, this is a, this is a, I forget the terminology classified or something. And so that mean that meant to him, no pictures, no cameras. Uh, he wasn't supposed to ask any questions. He was just supposed to come out, pick up the asset and then go complete the mission and drop it off. And so one day he was flying into Bagram. I think it's called Bagram Air Force Base. If I remember right. We need our Rogan fact checker. <laughs> I have to pull up the documentary or, or my script or the script for the documentary. And, but he flew into the base on a routine mission. And when he landed, they said, you're, you're picking up a high valued asset here. It's confidential. Uh, no pictures, no cameras, no questions, something to that effect. And so he lowered down the, the loading door on the, on the craft and, and walked outside the, to go see what it was that he was loading up on the, on the AC-130. And he was met by, he described them as, they look like intelligence officers, like Army intelligence or Air Force intelligence or something. Right away, he knew that whatever he was picking up was top secret. Hmm. And they told him, when, they, when, he, when he encountered them, they told him, they reiterated no pictures, no questions. And they walked him over to the, to the hangar. There was a, a large, there was a large pallet on the ground and and he could see that there was something under the pallet. It was covered. I mean, there's something laying on the pallet and covered with a big tarp. And he could see part of what was under the tarp sticking out. And, and, and he saw a foot and he saw, I think he saw a hand and he saw part of the head of what turned out to be a giant humanoid. And I remember him describing the skin as sort of pale grayish, which may be because the entity was dead at this point. And it had red hair. He described it had red hair and it had, he he remembers six toes and and six fingers. And he, and and what he really described with, with great detail, what was very vivid 
in his recollection was the stench. Hmm. He said this thing reeked. And and they and the guy standing around the, the this dead giant, again covered with a tarp, uh, started to to tell him what it was and and what the rumor was about it. And apparently, this giant was killed in a cave. I don't remember exactly where. Could have been Kandahar. I don't remember exactly if it even corresponded with with LA's with the giant that LA was told about. I think Steve Steve and I determined that it was a different giant. It was a different uh, incident that that uh, LA's uh, contact described, but but I don't remember how that shook out. I can't remember. Um, but this the pilot told us that he was told that I believe it was the Marines who encountered this giant. I I, I want to say it was Marines, a group of Marines who were patrolling, doing a routine patrol around a village in Afghanistan, and they noticed that, I remember him telling us that they noticed that the local villagers were leaving, were bringing food and other items into a cave and leaving it at the mouth of the cave. And it was sort of an act of reverence to, to something or someone that was in the cave. And so, of course, the, the, the Marines, let's just say they were Marines, the Marines thought that, that they're uh, aiding and abetting the, the Taliban, right. that, they're, mm. that they're supplying the Taliban in the cave. And so the Marines decided to go in and, and smoke them out. And they went in there thinking they were going to encounter a bunch of Taliban guys, you know, and have a firefight. And when they went into the cave, what they encountered instead was this 15 foot giant. Wow. And they describe him as they, they smelled him, if I remember right first. And then he came out of the shadows and obviously frightened them. And if I remember correctly, because I, I sometimes I get the two stories confused, L.A. story and, and ours, the giant killed one or two of the guys before they brought it down. And eventually they brought it down. They, they you know, they put, a, they put a whole lot of rounds into this giant. So uh, and then the giant was airlifted out. They brought a helicopter in and they lifted him out to the base. And then, of course, they called in this AC-130 pilot to come and pick him up. And when you're interviewing these people, is there any moment where you're like, any of your red flags go off? Like this is all made up? I mean, are you just going purely on your senses that this guy's telling the truth? Well, the first thing I do is evaluate the person. And uh, you always want to see credentials. And he showed us his credentials. He's active duty, AC-130 pilot. He wanted to be, <clears throat> he wanted to, his voice to be masked and he wanted to be filmed in silhouette. And that's a good sign. He's not looking for fame, not looking for money. Yeah. Nobody will, even knows who he is. So, so that was a good sign. And then, you know, having just shot the breeze with the guy for a while before we did the interview, I, I had a sense that the guy was telling the truth. He told me some other things too, relevant to some other topics. And I had a good sense about him. I, 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 I believe his story to be true. Now, the only way you could ever verify it would be if he had physical evidence, you know, or, or photos that could be verified or something. Um, so in, in as much as we could believe him, Steve and I believed him. I, I found him to be very, very credible. We wouldn't have put him in the film if we didn't think he was credible. Yeah. And so uh, long story short, he, he, he picked up, he loaded the body under the AC-130 and flew it to a base, I believe in Germany or no, uh, Qatar. He flew it to Qatar. And from Qatar it made its way to the United States. He, he learned later. And he heard, he said through the grapevine, he heard that the ultimate destination of this corpse, of this 15 foot tall humanoid giant, the ultimate destination was Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Hmm. And then that, you know, that was the end of it. That was the end of his, of his tale. And later on, by the way, let me say this. I almost forgot to say this. And, and Steve will attest to this, Steve Quayle. The pilot that we interviewed purposely withheld some details about his experience. And he told us that he did. He did that. He said, I'm not going to tell you guys the specific details I'm going to withhold. And the reason he did that was so that if somebody else comes out talking about this incident, he would be able to confirm if those people uh, were telling the truth. Yeah, it's like the police. I mean, like, like when, when they're, they let so much out to the public, but they know things that only, that there are things that only the murderer or, or perpetrator would know, right? The same, yeah. idea, it's the same way to fact check somebody. So they just exactly. didn't, hear it in the, didn't hear it in the news, didn't watch your film, didn't listen to LA, that it's legit. Yes. And so he called Steve and 
after after L.A. had come out with his, I, I believe it was he did an interview or he certainly put it in one of his films. And the AC-130 pilot got in contact with us and he was very excited. And he said, this guy's legit. Hmm. He's telling the truth. He describes some of the details that I purposely withheld. He was very excited about it. So that led us to believe that either LA's giant was the same story or it was another one of the same species in the general vicinity. Wow. So it was a second giant. How long do you think the giants lived? Did they live longer than human beings, you think? Who knows? One thing is clear is that they were, they were living underground, and that's why I think they had pale skin. Yeah. I think the pale skin was natural. It wasn't just because post-mortem. It was, it was the natural color of their skin. And I think they're living under the ground. These are cave-dwelling entities that have been forced into the caves by human beings. And, you know, when you, in the United States, for example, the Native Americans have tales of hunting the giants because the giants were evil. The giants, they, were, they feared them, and the giants were man-eaters, and so they hunted them. Yeah, it yellow hair. We talked about that in one of our early episodes, Nate. Yeah, yeah just like they hunted the, the, some of the wild animals and, the, and, and, and some of the, the megafauna back in the prehistoric times, they hunted the giants. And so they say... Well, my thought is if, they, if they're underground, I mean, they must be living a long time if they can't, unless they can breed somehow or, you know. Well, how who knows how, how vast, how extensive those underground cave systems are. Yeah. And where they go. And maybe it's not all that bad under the ground. So, th- yeah, this gives me tons of questions, Tim. I, like I, so in, in the entire narrative, we talk about the beginning of the giants and the watchers and the Nephilim and that whole, that whole process. And then we have the flood and... You have the, the two the two different theories, which is there's survivors or there's you know the the bloodlines carried on through one of Noah's sons' wives, and then we get to you know to modern day and there now we have stories about giants that still exist, and so how are they still existing? Are, do you think these are like Bigfoot, where people some people hypothesize that these that these might be like interdimensional or i just i want to know i don't, I don't subscribe to inner to the interdimensional hypothesis as it relates to giants or as it relates to aliens by the way because nobody understands what interdimensional means none of us have ever seen an extra dimension we have no idea what we're talking about it's mumbo jumbo um, we can kind of understand the concept of something being interdimensional but it's just a magic wand that we can wave at any problem and say you know oh i understand what's going on it's interdimensional Sure. When really, we don't have any freaking idea what interdimensional is. We don't. You can read Michio, one of Michio Kaku's books and get a scientific perspective on, on what interdimensional may mean. But outside of that, it's like trying to describe a color that, 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 doesn't, that we've never seen. So I, I try and stick with practical solutions that, that we can contemplate and that make sense within the world that we are familiar with. So here's a question. I mean, you, you brought up Bigfoot. We're talking about giants it, somehow existing and still being alive on the earth in caves well what about bigfoot yeah i mean are we to are we are, are we to suppose that bigfoot was on was on noah's ark i think they all went underground that's how i think they all survived yes so so there's a few options here i mean there's there's actually a lot there's a lot of possibilities they could have gone under the underground if you're talking about an advanced entity it could have gone off planet which is doubtful, but if you're, it depends on what you're talking about there. They could have been in a portion of the earth that was not completely submerged. I am of the persuasion that the flood of Noah was global. But having said that, is it possible that there were certain places that were not submerged? I guess it's possible. Anything's possible. And then you've got some people who believe that the flood of Noah was local. I think, I believe, you know, that some of the um, popular Christian Bible uh, scholars uh, like Mike Heiser believe that the flood of Noah, um, he may or may not, I, I don't recall if he does it or not, but certainly very respected scholars believe that the flood of Noah was not in fact global. It was local. That's possible. I can't rule that out. I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I tend to think it was global. I think it was because you see it in, you see it in the Americas too. You know what I mean? You see it all over the Grand Canyon you see it yes. through the New Mexico desert. Yes. There could have been multiple floods. There could have been uh, uh, floods all over the earth, but not over the entire earth. So there could have been flooding. By the way, 
when you talk about the flood of Noah, you have to, you have to answer the question in your mind that, that will give you clarity about the flood. Where did all the water come from? There, there's an old hypothesis that a lot of people used to subscribe to. I think most people have abandoned that ship, though, regarding a, a canopy, a canopy. Thank you. An ice canopy around the earth that melted. But you don't have to go that far. Stay on the earth. It's just stay, stay terrestrial when you think about this. All you have to realize is that there was an ice age. Much of the northern hemisphere, when you got close to the poles, and much of the southern hemisphere, close to the pole, was frozen, solid, with a whole lot of water, and frozen in the form of ice. And most of North America was covered in ice. And so you had a sliver, and it was a, it was a wide sliver, but you had this, you had this band an inhabitable band around the earth. Uh, and the temperatures would have been pr- pretty, pretty mild within that band. It, it wouldn't have been so variegated as it is today because you have, you have the, the caps are frozen. So again, not just the caps, uh, most of North America is frozen, right? So, so if there was an impact, let's say a comet, a cataclysmic event that suddenly melted that ice, you would have a global flood. Now, would the flood be, it would be global in nature for sure. Because you're talking about a whole lot of water dumping into the ocean, all the, dumping into the ocean all of a sudden. And also you're not just talking about a flood, you're talking about all kinds of cataclysmic uh, events happening simultaneously. Lots of volcanism, vol- volcanoes going off left and right, massive earthquakes, tidal waves, every kind of cataclysmic geological event you could imagine was, w- would have happened. It would have been a mass extinction event and those, those poles would have melted very quickly if the atmosphere heated up, and it would have amounted to essentially a global flood. Most parts of the earth would have experienced massive flooding. I've heard some people say that there was water underground, and then it, there was like plates that like collapsed and it just shot the well, water that's, out. That's, that probably happened as well. Yeah. It, it, it probably was a combination of all these things. And then the water receded slowly. Would it take a year? For the water to, to recede? Well, the poles re- refroze. And, and so that sucked up a lot of the water. What about the greenhouse effect that I've heard? Would like someone say there was a canopy, like a greenhouse around the water was trapped in the atmosphere? Uh, that's possible. The, the atmosphere was certainly different back in the Ice Age. I mean, if Jesus can you know, take a couple loaves of bread and some fish and make it a huge meal, I'm sure he can make it rain for... <laughs> you know, 40, uh, 40 days, right? Uh, it's making it rain. Yeah. Yeah. But, and he certainly could. I mean, you know, Jesus is, I, I, in my book, I refer to him as the singularity. He is the source of all creation. He could certainly do whatever he wants. However, the universe and the natural world in our lives are not encompassed by regularly occurring supernatural events. We, we live in terms of the occurrences that happen in our lives are pretty mundane and, and in the world in general, uh, it's like a clock. It's like, it's like the universe is ticking away and things are happening that were pre-planned, pre-ordained based on geological phenomena, astrological phenomena that was set in motion from the beginning. I don't know if, I'm, if you understand what, what I'm saying. So yeah. rather than just, you know, God snapping his fingers and making it rain, it's, it's more likely in my mind that it would have occur- occurred like most things occur in life that it would have been a preordained event, a comet or something headed for the earth that happened to hit the earth right at that moment in time, precisely uh, when uh, the earth was full of violence and corruption, because of course God is, is omnipotent, all-knowing, and would have known the hour in which he was going to set the, fl- the, the flood beforehand. So in this, of course, that, that hurdles us down a theological road there. But, yeah. but the point is that there are many scenarios in which things could have survived the flood. Now, could people have survived the flood? Could human beings have survived a global flood that maybe didn't submerge all of the earth? I think the answer to that question is no, because the climactic change would have been so dramatic that it would have been impossible to survive. It would have been impossible. You couldn't, I mean, it, it, it would have literally been impossible to survive. Everything would have been different. Uh, suddenly, for those people who are alive, they would just would not have had the wherewithal to survive that level of cataclysm. However, could a Bigfoot type creature survive? Yeah. A creature that's more feral, a creature that lives in the wild and that had the capacity, maybe, I think they do evidently with their, because their eyes are black, to live 
under the ground? Could they have just retreated into the inner earth? Yeah. And, 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 and the giants, you know, do the same. Could that have happened? And, it, and I guess, is it possible that some humans could have done it too? I guess that's possible as well. But, you know, the, the fact is that, that, and I say this as a fact, and I'm sure you guys probably would agree with me. I think, it's, I think that the existence of, of the Sasquatch is a fact. I think it's a stone cold fact. I love that. <laughs> there you go. There you go, everyone. Just like That's the existence it. of giants. I'm not yeah. talking about 20 foot giants. I'm talking about 15, 12, 13, 15 foot giants. In my mind is a stone cold fact, even today. Very rare, but they exist still to this day. If that's the case, and we're talking about, we're talking to nature as, you know, the laws of nature exist and like you're speaking about, and, and there's, there's these ways that, that things happen as they're supposed to happen because there's order. Then is there like a breeding population of giants then? Probably. I, I, that's always wondered, like, because, you know, you have these, you have the spirit father, earthly mother, and you get a giant. Are, then there, are there lady giants then too? Yeah, let's, let's just right away eliminate magic. So that's the first step in, I, I think, rational thinking is we eliminate magic. Magic is not a possibility. So, and when I say magic, by the way, I mean, that encompasses the term supernatural. Like feeding the 5,000. Well, that's on a different level. You're talking about the maker. You're talking about the son of God. Okay. That's a different okay. thing. Mir- miraculous, right? Yeah. So, so obviously God intervenes whenever he wants and does whatever he wants to do. Those are rare occasions. And we all have to admit that those are rare occasions. So, and even historically speaking, those are rare occasions. Um, and a lot of that was done to confirm the person of Christ. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the prophecies and things in the Old Testament and the things that were done were, were done to confirm Christ also. That's another discussion. So uh, when we rule out some of the more fantastical possibilities, we're left with much more pragmatic situations like breeding. Do the giants breed? Well, they have to breed. How else do they persist in the earth if they don't breed? I don't think giants live for thousands and thousands of years. They probably have a longer lifespan than we do. And I don't have any definitive reason I can tell you for that. It's just a, it's a hunch. It's just my suspicion that they live longer than we do. The Bigfoots may live longer than we do as well, uh, but they have to breed. Right. Just to they have to breed. Yeah. There isn't like a giant factory, you know, like uh, pumping out giants. <laughs> and that's why I said eliminate the magic because it's too easy to say, well, they're supernatural. Right. That's too easy. I don't play that game. I'm just it's like, too easy. You know, the lady giants don't get any pub. We just never hear about them. We hear about Goliath and his brothers. <laughs> and Well, Patty, you know, the most famous Bigfoot, she's a girl. They must have, they must have females. They must have I mean, females. Well, the other theory too, though, is that there's a ruling class in, in the ancient world. A lot of these giants then, you know, then – had offspring with regular women so yes so so yeah i mean you can you can you can breed through the human line intermixing the 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 giant uh, offspring with and people say well how does that happen if they're giants how do they copulate with a woman well they just do it instead of doing it when they're 20 they do it when they're 13 you know there's lots of different uh, options it's you know uh, it's again you just gotta think really really prag practically about these things and and there's an abundance of options and i don't know which one is the case but i would guess i would assume that there's female giants and that they they copulate they procreate offspring and just like again just like the, i think the bigfoot creature is a great comparison they're out there they exist they breed mm-hmm. they produce offspring there isn't a bigfoot factory they don't live forever they do what all, the rest of us do on planet earth they they have to breed and reproduce and so i would guess that the, the giants have to do the same thing so now i don't believe that there's a whole lot of giants out there yeah just like i don't believe that there's a whole lot of bigfoots out there i think they're far and few between well there was you know obviously and then they they were destroyed see i I've kind of formulated a th- an opinion and a thought that the Earth had a lot of water in the atmosphere because you find all these hidden megalithic cities like off the coast of California, right near uh, Catalina Island. There's some megalithic structures. There's megalithic structures on in Japan mm-hmm. underwater. And Atlantis was supposedly covered in water. So what if the Earth, at one point, most of the water is in the atmosphere cause it, and that produces the megafauna and everything's bigger and then it all comes down and buries all these ancient these ancient cities? Uh, that would, that could supply some of the water, but it could not supply all of the water. You, I mean, you're talking about a tremendous amount of water. And then it, yeah. Well, let's assume that the flood covered uh, Mount Everest 
I mean, we are talking about a, an, an almost an unimaginable amount of water. Mm. And just water in the atmosphere would not cut it. Now, I do believe that the atmosphere was moister and much more oxygen rich. You had to have, you had to have that for the megafauna. Well, you could have water. But doesn't it say in the Bible the com- water came from below and, and above? I, well, I, I want to say that. I think it would have rain came up from the ground, right? Yeah, in the book of Genesis, it says that the earth was watered with the, with the dew. But you could have very well you could have you could have it's very possible that there were these large aquifers under the ground these underground uh oceans like we know exist on some of the planets there's veritable o- oceans under the surface there are probably was a lot more water under the earth it could have been like an ocean of water under the earth before the flood and because of the cataclysm it 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 ruptured and came and came out Came, came spewing out of the ground, cracking open the earth, which would have accounted for a lot of the water. You have a lot of rain, you have water coming up from under the ground, and you have the ice caps melting. I think uh, that that would account for a global flood. I mean, do you think, you think that, uh, I mean, because at the beginning of Genesis, we talk about how the earth was formless and, and the Spirit of God hovered over the water. So was it that the water was just essentially pulled? To the to the pole to the poles and and the light. Well, that's what happens, you know, when when water freezes. So if you imagine, let's say, you imagine the Earth with no ice at the at the at the poles. There's no ice at the poles. Obviously, all of our coasts would be obliterated because there'd be a lot more water in the ocean then. So then imagine the temperature of the Earth dropping dramatically, and and at the poles where it's the coldest, forming ice. And so it's almost like the ice is grabbing the water and pulling it back and freezing it. Mm. And, so, and so it's like ice is it's storing up a lot of water at yeah. the poles. And if those poles melt, then you get a lot more water in the oceans. And of course, this is the, the, this is the concern of, uh, of global warming, which, which I certainly don't subscribe to the, the man-made, man-made climate change. Although climate change is just a fact of life on planet Earth, dramatic climate change happens over well, we've had ice ages. the I eons. Mean, it's like a look at. It cools and warms and cools and warms. You don't get an ice age without it cooling, yeah. It's a cycle. It's, it's the Earth's position in, in, in the orbit around the sun. There's, a, there's some kind of a configuration, an astronomical configuration, with the Earth and the sun and possibly some other planets or some other kind of cosmological phenomena that causes the melting of the poles and then the refreezing of the poles. And, and I don't mean refreezing like they are today. I'm talking about an ice age. I'm talking about when I, say, when I say freezing of the poles, I should be more clear. I mean an ice age. I mean not just the poles. You know, where I'm sitting in Montana would be a big, huge sheet of ice. Yeah. I, I'm talking about most of North America frozen. You know, and so is this cyclic? Has the earth been going through this for millions of years? I think so. I think it's like a clock. And so you get, the, you get these dramatic climate change events and ice ages that are recurrent on the earth, on the planet. And so was that part of what happened? Was that part of the equation of the Noahic flood? I think it was. Yeah, it makes sense to me if that happens. And if you think about the world as kind of like previously like a greenhouse and then someone takes the plastic off the top suddenly only certain plants in certain areas are going to survive and the other ones are going to freeze on the on the on the on the edges right or or if there's a, an asteroid or a comet strike sure that kicks up a lot of dust and lots of volcanism going on in the earth you get all this soot in the atmosphere volcanic ash and and and, and just soot and it blocks out the sun and so what what would happen in that scenario is you would get dramatically colder temperatures on the earth there's there's a lot of different like i said there's a lot of different possibilities what about events like sodom and gomorrah where are they trying to make giants again i'm not sure that sodom and gomorrah had anything to do with giants judgment right well they're doing something they're doing well they were exceedingly debauched over in in sodom and gomorrah i mean you you, i talk about this scenario in my book i I kind of uh maybe you can call it hyper analyze things and (laughs) because i like to get down to like the nitty-gritty the everyday practical view because that's the view that we all come from that's that's our lives who is this encarnacion (laughs) (laughs) that's one of my favorite movies by the way yeah (laughs) when you think about uh, sodom and gomorrah we have to pull ourselves out of kind of a Sunday school perception and, and instead let the details, let the story be as raw and as perplexing uh, and as 
pragmatic as possible. So, so you have Sodom and, or was it Gomorrah? <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, where Lot was in, was Lot in it's Gomorrah or Sodom? I can't remember. Um, his wife, they're basically his wife twin still cities. There somewhere. Uh, I want to say it was Gomorrah. I can't remember. It was one of those two. And you have this, this, so the story goes, to be honest with you, I should probably just read it because it's very, very interesting. And it's only about a paragraph here. Well, it's a very interesting event that, that we're all, we we're all, we all are familiar with it, but how many of us have actually really thought it through? What's... See, I, it seems like God gets involved when we do DNA experiments, like in the days of Noah and Tower of Babel and, to me, it always feels like when we start tinkering with the DNA, then you see more of the hand of God getting, you know, okay, stop. No, I agree. I think that there's a line that we cross when God intervenes in a big way. And I think tampering with the genetic, the, 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 the genetic book of life uh, is crossing that line. Yeah. And, and it, it demands judgment. It incurs judgment. I wonder if they were doing something like that in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were trying to like, Rehatch. Well, they're, they were exceedingly immoral. I mean, that's part of the Bible says that explicitly. Yeah, but so's so's Vegas. So you know, so many places. So, I mean, sure. What's the difference between a, a, a city of sin and Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, to me, it would, maybe the New, the New Testament. Well, I think there's a pretty big difference. And again, if you analyze the story, and I'm trying to find it in my book because um, it's just like a, I just, it's just like a paragraph, and it would be, I think, enlightening. In my book, I talk about this, 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 the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I find it to be very interesting because, you know, you've got two angels that walk, just walk into a city, and, and, and what happens is, is very perplexing. So I'm seeing if I, need to, if I need to put this in context here before I start, before I read this only paragraph. I'm talking about in my book here, this portion of the, of the book that I'm going to read, I'm talking about the appearance of angels, and I make the case in my book that Angels look very much like us. Indeed, we look like them. And they're, they're, they're almost indistinguishable from us. That's their natural appearance. That's not them taking on some, a form of a human being or just appearing to us like human beings. I think that's what they look like. That's their anatomy. So I don't think they're meta. I don't think that I don't believe that angels or demons or fallen angels or whatever have the ability to metamorphosize. I do not subscribe to that. So I don't think that an angel can, you know, metamorphosize, or, or let's say a, a, what people call quote unquote fallen angel, which is a contrivance, the word um, that we've invented. They're, the word, the term fallen angel is not actually a, a biblical word. It, it's descriptive enough to understand that these are rebel, angelic rebels. Uh, and the reason why I couch it in those terms is because I try, and, I try and pull people away from the idea that angels are just these magical beings with wings whose sole existence is to kind of minister to us or interact with prophets or something like that. I think that's a massive misconception that we have. In fact, in the book, I make the case, the book, by the way, that I keep referencing is called Birthright that I just published uh, about a month ago. In the book, I make the case that what we're dealing with when we talk about angels is we're dealing with an, an, an elder race of beings that predate us. It's an older, it's an exceedingly ancient civilization that predates yeah. our civilization. These are not entities with wings or multiple faces or anything like that. They look just like us. In fact, we look like them. They're not human. Uh, they're not made from the substance of the earth like we are, but they are humanoid. It, this is not angels morphing into human beings, metamorphosizing into human beings. It's an important thing to keep in mind, okay? So uh, now I'll read from the book here. The, the biblical narrative seems to insinuate a description of the angels that is consonant with that of the Nordics. Okay, I'm talking about the Nordics. Have you guys heard about the Nordics? Uh, there's an alien race that people talk about. People, ufologists talk about the Nordics. They, they're these human-like aliens that they look like us, but they got blonde hair and blue eyes. And so I'm writing about that before I get to this paragraph. So. We haven't talked about it on the show. Okay, so, so on the eve of Sodom's destruction, Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city when he saw two men approaching. He immediately recognized these men as angels. How could this be unless their appearance was distinct in some way? Okay, just full stop right there. How in the world did Lot, Lot immediately recognize these two men as angels? You know, I'm not reading him. I'm asking you guys. So how, how in the world does Lot recognize these guys as angels? You must have seen angels before, right? 
I think the answer is apparent, and, and I'll answer it in a minute. So continuing here, Sodom was in Judea. Sodom was in Judea. The men of Judea were ethnically Semitic, meaning they tended to look like the people of the Middle East today. Uh, Relatively short compared to Europeans with tan skin, dark eyes, and black or brown hair. Two tall blondes with blue eyes and luminous white skin would stick out like a sore thumb in Sodom. uh, The unique and striking appearance of these men is exhibited in the reaction of the Sodomites, who, being raving homosexuals, gathered together at Lot's door, demanding that he bring out his guests so that they could have their way with them. No ordinary Semitic men, no matter how handsome, would have attracted this kind of attention in a city bustling with activity. So the point here is, I think that Lot recognized these men as angels because they were tall, blonde, had bright blue eyes, and fair skin. They're probably six and a half feet tall, and Lot, coming from the family line of Abraham, would have been told stories about the angels. And and certainly the descriptions of these angels would have been included. And, and, and never, never are you going to find a, a living description. When I say living, I mean an encounter with an angel, an actual encounter with an angel, not in a prophetic context, a a real-time encounter with an angel in which the angel is described as having wings or being like 10 feet tall or something or 15 feet tall. You're never going to find that. You're only going to find actual encounters in the Bible with angels where they look like young men, young men, young men.